All right. Hey, how are we feeling tonight? We feeling pretty good? All right. As usual, this section is happy and everyone else is tired and sad. No, I'm just kidding. You guys have been great tonight. It seems like we have a little more energy than the last, like, month and a half. Can you guys believe that January is already almost over? Like you realize one-twelfth of, of 2024 is, is already pretty much gone. I mean, it's just crazy. Time slows down for nobody. So who remembers, with it being the new year, who remembers what we're talking about? Spiritual disciplines. Yes, yes, tonight. What's that? Fasting? You missed that part. I'm just kidding. No, we, we did talk about fasting. Um, no, who remembers what disciplines we've talked about so far? Meditation. Meditation. There you go. Silent solitude, prayer, fasting, Sabbath, study, service. Oh, my goodness. Dude, you guys have the best memory ever. All right, now who can guess? I gave you the full list of 10 on week one. What are the last two spiritual disciplines we are talking about tonight? Worship and confession. Look at your neighbor and say, worship and confession. Someone in here is already uncomfortable. No one likes the word confession. No one does. No one wants to do it. But that's what spiritual disciplines are for, right? Spiritual disciplines are disciplines because we have to do them when we don't feel like it, right? But what does it take to grow? It takes discipline. What does it take to complete New Year's resolutions or goals of any kind? Discipline. It's easy to start, but what matters most is how you finish the race. <clears throat> I remember, since we're, we're still talking about the new year, <clears throat> I went to Japan like, uh, I don't even know, probably like seven or eight years ago now. I don't even remember. Uh, but I went to Japan, and last time I preached, I talked about a couple of Chinese dudes, Terry Wu and Bai Naifu. You guys remember those guys? The lazy guys that made us have to do extra sprints every week or every day. Um, and now I'm going to tell you about my Japanese friend, knew him. His name is Ryohei Kobayashi. Look at your, look at your other neighbor and say, Ryohei Kobayashi. Great. You guys are fluent in Japanese as of tonight. Put it on your resume. I'm Japanese, dude. I wish. I'm just kidding. Not really. But here's the deal. I had this friend, Ryohei Kobayashi, and I went to Japan, and I stayed with him and his family. And the thing about Japan uh, is they are huge on honoring people. Their culture is very, very disciplined. Their culture is so disciplined, in fact, that they actually have a term, a specific name that they give people that literally work themselves to death. All right, that sounds crazy, but there are actually examples after examples after examples of people that will, like, pass away at work at the age of, like, 30-some because literally they will not stop working. They are disciplined to a fault. They won't stop. And here's the deal. Uh, they're also disciplined when it comes to honoring people. And so his parents, who own like an international cosmetics company, which I didn't know, uh, we were in PE class when he was in the, in the States, and he opened his wallet when we were changing for PE, and I saw there was like $10, $50 bills just in his wallet. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, you can't just carry $500 in your wallet and leave it in a high school locker room. And he looks at me and he goes, oh, it's all good. I got way more than that on my credit card. My parents will just replace it. I'm like, what? And I, and I, had, known, I had known this kid for, for almost a year at this point, never thought to ask him, oh, what do your parents do? I probably could have assumed, oh, he's studying abroad for a year. His parents are probably doing all right. Uh, but found out they own this company. So we get to Japan, or I get to Japan, and because they want to honor me as being his closest friend in the United States, they're like, all right, Logan. Like, we are going to give you the experience. We're going we're gonna to make sure you, you see Japan. So they start sending us to these crazy dinners, um, these, like, Michelin star dinners. It's like the, the, the peak of food in the world. Um, and they start sending us to, like, these hot spring resorts and, like, Mount Fuji and all these places. And then we get to New Year's Day. So I went over Christmas and New Year's. They're, like, spoiling me. I feel like I'm a king. I'm like, what is this what it's like? Like, this is crazy. Um, and they're like, all right, so New Year's, uh, what we do is we go to a temple. I'm like, uh-oh, this is not good. In fact, I already told them multiple times. They're like, what, they're like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'm like, I'm like, well, 
I want to be a pastor. And, like, and they're, like, they're like, what does that even? So we get to New Year's Day, and they want to go to this, this temple. And in Japan, uh, they, they uh, practice two religions primarily. One is Buddhism, and one is the Japanese version, essentially, of Buddhism, which is called Shinto. And so Koba was what, is what I call them. Koba's parents practice Shinto. So we go to this super prominent temple, and we walk in there, and I'm, like, praying the whole time. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is not good. God, I am not here to worship whatever this is. Uh, so I'm like praying for all these people. I'm like, God, save these people. Holy cow. Um, we're, we're at this giant red, there's like this giant red bell hanging there. And I'm like, what in the, like. So I'm walking through and we, we go up to this giant fire that's like in the middle of this courtyard. And it's like, they like made it smoke a lot. They like added stuff. So it's just kind of like a lot of smoke coming out of this thing. And my friend Koba goes up, and he sticks his face fully in the smoke, just boom, in the smoke. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, the smoke makes you smarter. And I'm like, no, it gives you lung cancer. He's like, no, no. He's like, put your face. I'm like, no, sorry, no, not putting my face. We go up to this, we go up to this other spot, and there's like this wooden box that's like fenced off. I'm like, that must be an important box. He's, he hands me like a little like one yen coin. It's like less than a cent in, uh, in U.S. dollars. And he goes, all right, you have to shoot it into the box like a basketball. I'm like, what's that about? He's like, if you make it, you got good luck for the whole year. I'm like, who said that? Is that written somewhere? And then we move on. He's like, all right, like we're going to buy some good luck charms. We're going to buy some paper fortunes. And the paper fortunes will either tell you if you have bad luck or good luck for the whole year. And I'm like, dude, this is crazy. This is crazy. Why do I share this? Because this is the way that, that people that practice Buddhism or Shinto, they start off their year relying on things like luck, relying on things like giving money or putting your face in smoke as if that's going to help them uh, reach enlightenment and, and have good blessings and good luck for the year. But what have we been talking about for the last month? The fact that, one... We serve the one true God, the God of the Bible, the God of all creation. His name is Jesus. He's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we also know that the way to blessing, the way to getting closer to God is with spiritual disciplines. It's not by paying money. It's not by doing some ritualistic thing, but it's by being spiritually disciplined in these different areas that you all just rattled off to me. Now, who would say your goal is still, since two weeks ago, your goal this year is still, I want to be closer to God this year. I want to hear from him. I want to see his face. Great. So we are all on the same page. We are still sticking with us. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have put any of the disciplines we've talked about already, how many of you have put them into practice? Some. I saw some not confident hand raises, which is questionable. All right. Hey, you know what? I love it. Listen, <clears throat> God's not expecting, expecting you to have every practice down today, right now, to be perfect right now and everything, but part of being disciplined is taking those small steps every day and building on new habits so that you can grow in your depth, in your relationship with God. And so tonight, we are going to conclude this series. Uh, we are approaching February. Who knows what February is? Love month. Oh my gosh. Look at, your, look at the person behind you and say, Valentine's Day is coming. <laughs> Bet you weren't expecting to talk to that person tonight. Got him. Got him. You might be like Will Wong, and you might meet someone on Roblox over Valentine's Day. <laughs> Sorry, Will. You clapped, you clapped for yourself earlier, so you're proud of it. Anyways, anyways, Valentine's Day is coming, and so we are going to be doing a relationship series. Last year... Who remembers our series we called Red Flags? You guys remember that? Ooh, wow, we really liked that one. Really liked that one. Now, just like we did last year, we're going to be talking about what God has to say about all relationships, dating, marriage, friendships. We're going to have a Q&A panel, just like we did last year, so you guys will be able to ask whatever you want, and we will have to answer it on the spot. Uh, so be uh, prepared for that. On social media, you'll be seeing a text number soon at some point where you can actually preemptively send in questions. That's going to give you a higher chance that we'll actually answer your question. So just get ready for that. But tonight, we are ending our series on spiritual disciplines talking about worship and confession. Now, 
Uh, these are two disciplines. A lot of the disciplines that we've preached so far kind of work together, right? Like silence and solitude, they work together. Prayer and fasting, they work together. If you do one poorly, you're probably not good at the other. Tonight, these disciplines are very similar in this sense. They require other people. Worship and confession require other people. Now, you might disagree initially on this. You might say, oh, I can worship wherever I want on my own. I don't need other people to worship. Now, what I'm referring to is in order to do these, these disciplines with excellence in full, they will require other people. You can confess. You might say, I can confess to God. I can confess my sins. I can confess my wrongdoings to God. That's good enough. Well, you're going to see, not from Logan's opinion, but from God's word, in order to do these disciplines well, we are actually going to need to do them alongside other people. Now, if you're ready to be challenged tonight by God's word, say, sounds good. Sounds good. Here we go. Now, why is the spiritual discipline of worship a discipline? Because to worship something or someone, it requires us to take our eyes off of ourselves off of what we want, what we feel, and to simply glorify whatever it is we are worshiping. Now, we've preached this before, but all of us worship something. In that sense, we all glorify something. We all put our, we all live for something. But the problem is with a lot of, a lot of Christians is that they claim to worship God, but really they're kind of worshiping themselves. And so don't expect when I'm talking about the discipline of worship that I'm actually going to sit here and, and preach lollipops and licorice and candy and rainbows. I think that God has a word for us tonight to really challenge our view of this discipline of worship. It can be easy to worship in a highly emotional moment where the music is loud. Maybe it's a, a, a more somber sounding worship song. Maybe we haven't heard it as much. It's still fresh and new to us. It's easy to feel like we're experiencing God. We're crying. It, it feels right and good. But that's not a moment that requires discipline. That's not a moment of worship that requires discipline. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this. But um, one thing I have to say is this. I see, t I see a number of different type of people uh, that worship in corporate settings, right? Because we're talking about how we need other people in these moments of worship. There are some people that worship is not actually worship, it's actually a performance. In the sense that they're trying to sing really well, they're trying to make sure people see that their hands are raised really well, they're swaying right, they're moving right, they're looking right. And it's more about who's around them and how are they being seen? How are they looking? Can I tell you this, especially, this is for everybody, but especially if you are a worship leader in any sense at all, if you help as, as a vocalist, instrumentalist, doesn't matter. The last thing we need up here leading worship is the next Taylor Swift, elevation worship, upper room, you name it. We don't need performers. What we need, both, both in the crowd, as a person that's here to worship, and as worship leaders, we need people that are worshiping wholeheartedly as an example, leading us into the presence of God. But can I challenge those of you who aren't on the worship team? The way you worship is gonna impact the way other people are worshiping around you. How would you feel if you were a new person coming to a church? Maybe you're unsaved or maybe you're saved, but you're kind of on the fence uh, or you, you, you believe in God. You come into a church and you look on the screen and there's lyrics that say, oh, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. We love you. You're the best. God, you're so amazing. We glorify you. And then you look at the stands, and you see a bunch of people straight-faced, arms folded. Maybe they're looking at their phone. Maybe they're looking at the person next to them. As a new person, would you think, oh, wow, I really, I really want to be here right now because everyone's really bought into what we're talking about, what we're singing. Some of you guys, worship can be a little bit of a performance, and we've all kind of struggled with that. Many of us have. But some of us, we're still at, on the same other side of that token. We still think we're too cool, too mature, too put together to worship God in full. If God is who he says he is, if he's the God of all creation, and we are imperfect little people, not a single person here is too cool to worship God. And you might say, well, raising hands isn't for me. Singing out loud isn't for me then my question for you is, do you think heaven's gonna be a bunch of people with their arms folded, standing with a straight face? 
Or do you think when we're in heaven one day, when we're praising God, it's going to be exciting and joyful and loud, and, and we're going to be jumping for joy, and our hands are going to be raised? I think it's going to be a place full of joy. This actually is reflected in the Bible. We see that angels are surrounding the throne of God, praising him 24-7. Heaven is a place where we are going to worship God. And if we can't even do it here, how can we expect to do it in heaven? Let's read this verse from Psalm 40, starting in verse 1. It's a little bit longer. Bear with it. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He's given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all of your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. Now, this is a psalm written by David, the psalmist, King David, who was called a man after God's own heart. He was a man who loved to worship. We see in the Psalms, he's always worshiping or he's crying out to God. Now, let me give you a, I want you to understand there's a difference between crying out to God and worshiping God. Crying out to God is saying, God, I need you. God, I'm broken. I need your, I need your healing. I need your presence. You're crying out to him. And then there's worship where you are glorifying God. There is not a request. There is not a me, 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 I'm broken, I'm experiencing this, God. It's God, I could never begin to even start listing off how good you are. All the good deeds you've done, all the great things you've accomplished, I couldn't even begin to list them off. God, you are greater and higher than all things. It is glorifying him. This is worship. But why, why do I share this verse with you? David starts by a little bit of testimonial. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair. So it's not that we can't approach God and, and, and remember our testimony. But one thing I see a lot of times is people approach moments of worship like it's a time to be somber and depressed and cry it out, and man, things have been tough. That is not worship. But what I love about the tone of David here is that he shares his testimony, but there's a joy about it. He's not saying, boo me, oh, that life is so horrible right now, or I, man, I, man, those times were really bad. He's saying, yes, I despaired, but you were there. There's a but God. See, testimonies aren't saying, look at me, I'm going through such a tough time. Testimonies and worship is saying, yes, things have been tough, but God has been good. This is the beginning of the discipline of worship, understanding the heart of it. So I want to, we, we kind of talked a little bit about what worship is not. In short, worship is not about you, it's about God. And if you approach worship with, God, I want something from you, God, this is about me, you're not worshiping. So let's talk about what worship is. We talked about how worship is a celebration, how we are celebrating the goodness of God, praising him for who he is making him the focus. We talked about a little bit how worship is a proclamation. Now, we talked about how it's not a performance, so we're not worshiping or pursuing God in any way to be seen by people, but it is still true that you are seen by people, that people do see how you worship. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying we have to check our hearts. We need to worship God in full with all of our heart and we need to also know that people do see the way we worship. Do you want to know how a lot of people are led to Christ? Sometimes it's by the direct sharing of the gospel, but a lot of times people are led to Christ when they see how someone is still worshiping despite what they've got going on. So in the same way, when someone comes into a church and they, they see people that are, that are hands, uh, arms crossed, uh, straight faced, not paying attention, if they walk in and there's a bunch of sad people weeping, how are they going to believe that God is good? It's not that you can't cry in the presence of God. I do it all the time, all right? But it is this, that worship should be full of joy, and the way we worship proclaims 
the gospel. You look at Paul and Silas. We've read this story before, gone through it. Paul and Silas get imprisoned. They're put in the inner cell. They're chained and shackled up. And in the middle of the night, in the darkest cell, they are praising God and giving him thanks. While they were unjustly put in prison, they are giving God thanks. And I'm sure they were aware these other prisoners are going to hear us praising. But they were actually from their hearts praising God, saying, God, you're good despite all of this. And what happened? An earthquake came. All the cell doors were opened. The guard's family was saved. The guard was saved. Why? Because of their worship. Their worship impacted those around them. So this is a discipline that's not just direct for you. You have the opportunity to to lead people to Christ based on the way you worship. And we're still just talking about worship in praise and song. Now, worship fixes our focus. A lot of times we approach God in worship, and the problem is that people come to God and they're so sad in worship and they're so depressed and they're not actually worshiping because they're still magnifying and focused on their problems and their struggles. But the beauty of when you actually discipline yourself and say, I'm not going to think about that right now. I'm not going to cry out to God about that right now. I'm going to worship him. Is when you're done worshiping, suddenly your focus is fixed. Suddenly you're like, whoa, God is so much bigger than all of this. I don't have to be as anxious as I was when I came in, as depressed as I've been, because your focus has been fixed back on God. You now are reminded how much bigger he is. We talked about how worship is a reflection of heaven, how we're going to be praising God for all eternity. And when we get to worship in a corporate setting like this, it is reflective of a time that's coming. And it's powerful, a powerful reflection. Now, here's the one that we like. Worship prepares us to hear from God. In Isaiah chapter 6, we're not going to read it. It's too long to read all these. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah hears from God and gets sent out. He says, here I am, Lord, send me. This moment, this interaction with God was directly following a moment of worship, a moment of worshiping God. In Matthew 28, the Great Commission, raise your hand if you know the Great Commission, to go out and make disciples of all nations, the greatest challenge of all time, this was given by Jesus after a moment of worship. He gave this word to those who had just been worshiping. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost following a time of prolonged worship and waiting. So in other words, when we worship, when we glorify God and wait on him and make him the focus, it actually prepares our hearts to hear from him. And God can speak to you in worship, but a lot of times I found, especially after things like camp, when I spent so much time worshiping, I get home and God is still speaking things because my heart's been put in the right place. My focus has been put in the right place. Worship is something that fixes our mind, our perspective. Now, here is the most important part of worship. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So what is the way to truly worshiping God? To ridding yourself of your control over your own life, your own body, and saying, God, I'm a living sacrifice. I'm going to keep myself holy. I'm going to pursue you and and obey your word and your calling. I'm going to serve your people. What does Jesus say? Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of these, you have done for me. In other words, to worship God, you have to love God and love people. Now, that's a cliche saying we say a lot, love God, love people. But it's true. You cannot love God and not love people. You have to love both. And we're going to talk all about it in February, but love is not a feeling. God is love. And God is a God of action. So love is an action. That means that when you see someone that's broken, that's down, when you're serving that person and helping them, you're doing that for Jesus. You're worshiping in that moment. When you get out of your comfort zone and invite someone to church, you're worshiping God. When you get out of your comfort zone and maybe you give something to speed the light and it was supposed to be 
going out to food with friends this weekend. You're worshiping. Guys, when we live as a living sacrifice, that is our true and pleasing worship. The greatest offering we can give is our lives. Now, uh, we are going to move into this next discipline. You guys still with me? Do we need to stand up and do jumping jacks? Are we depressed? Okay, you sound depressed. I love it. Well, I don't love it, but, but it is what it is. Now, the discipline of confession. Why is the discipline of confession a discipline? Because in order to confess having done something wrong, having sinned, we have to uh, say no to shame, to guilt, and, and really, ultimately, we have to say no to pride. Because what happens when we make a mistake? Our first inclination is often to hide it, to cover it up, to act like it didn't happen. In our flesh, we don't want people to know that we're broken, flawed, struggling, certainly not addicted to any kind of sinful lifestyle. But that desire to not want people to see the bad parts of us is a pride issue. Saying that I would rather people see me as the put together perfect person. Before I even get into the rest of this, God's word shares with us that all have fallen short of the glory of God. So when you walk around acting like you're the perfect person, what you're really doing is saying, I'm going to act like I'm the one exception to God's already stated word. He said, all have fallen short, but I'm going to act like it wasn't me, though. I'm not included in that all. It's a, it's a facade. It's fake. A spiritually mature person sees someone's sin and, and understands that they've been there, that we've all been there. We're greatly concerned with how people think of us, and unfortunately, some of us are more concerned about being liked by people than being healed by God. We listen to this lie of the enemy. You can deal with it on your own, and nobody will have to know. You can deal with it on your own, and no one has to know. I can hide this sin until it's gone, and then it's just done. Can I tell you something? Sin is not a, a fake it till you make it issue. It cannot be solved by hiding it. God's word already says all things will come to light. You cannot hide your sin. It's impossible. What it will do is fester and grow, and it will become worse. It will come back with a vengeance. So how do we get this healing? Well, it's the discipline of confession. Shocker. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, we're not going to read this one either. It says that we should place no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. Again, in Matthew 26, verse 41, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, God, take this cup from me, but your will be done. He knows that his crucifixion is coming. Of course, naturally, he's like, I don't want to do this, but God, if I need to, I will. Now, there's a few disciples that are there, supposed to be keeping watch, and they fall asleep. Jesus finds them asleep. And one of the things he tells them is this, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The thing with sin is that vast majority of us know when something's wrong and we know we shouldn't do it. In our spirit, we don't want to, but our flesh is weak. And when we try to address sin on our own, the problem is, is with our, in our flesh, we're not capable of conquering sin. If we were capable of conquering sin on our own, Jesus wouldn't have had to come down. Jesus wouldn't have had to give his life on the cross if we were so powerful. So why do we need confession? James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Look at your neighbor and say, healed. You guys still sound depressed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So we see a pairing here between confessing and praying, and praying with a righteous person. Now, we talked a lot about James in 2023. We had a whole Sunday series on it that seemed like it went a long time, probably because we did James in a lot of our youth life groups. But we know that James, the writer of the book James, is the half-brother of Jesus. 
He's a cut and dry writer. There's not a lot of room for questioning in what he writes. So what does he state here? That we confess to each other as in confess to person and pray with one another that we may find healing. So I mentioned earlier, some of you might say, oh, I don't need to confess to another person. I can confess directly to God. Well, you can confess directly to God, but what God provides is forgiveness. You confess to God and you get forgiveness when you pair it with repentance. You confess to another person and you get healing. I wonder if some of you have been falling into the same pattern of sin over and over again because you've still chosen pride and said, I'm not going to share this with someone. I'm just going to pray to God because it's easy because I don't have to feel shamed about it. And then it comes back again. I wonder if God's saying, you know, I want you to take the humble route. I want you to share and you will find the healing that you're looking for. I really truly believe in God. I feel is speaking this to me as I was writing this message. Some of you tonight have been struggling with a sin of some kind. And God has not only forgiveness for you tonight, but healing for you tonight. Shame is from the devil. Guilt is from the devil. But what we do is when we cling to pride and then we make a mistake, we begin to feel shame. We have to let go of these things as we confess to one another. Worship team, you can head on up. We're going to have a little bit of a longer response time today. We're going to read this last passage, 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5. It says, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. I want to just focus on a couple words. It says, talks about living in spiritual darkness. Some of you, you have been living for God. You are living for him. Can I, can I encourage someone in this room tonight? If you're living for God and you make a mistake, it doesn't mean you're now living for darkness. It means you had a moment of darkness. It means you had a moment of failure. But some of you, you might be living for darkness. Your whole life might be about what your flesh wants, what your brain wants, and you're not really all too concerned with what does God actually want from me? What is God pleased with? Tonight is an opportunity that you can step out of that life of living in darkness and live in the light, live with God and find the freedom and the healing that comes from that, the cleansing. I love that it uses the word cleansing because sin makes you feel dirty. That's part of the shame and the guilt. But when we confess to one another, when we confess to God, there's a cleansing that happens. So why don't we all stand to our feet? Hidden sin not only corrupts you from the inside, but hidden sin will tempt you to hide from other people. Why? Because it will make you feel afraid of being caught. Like they'll figure out who you really are. Like they'll see you for the broken person that you are. Tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to take action on both of these disciplines. That is the praise portion of worship. We're going to have an opportunity to worship God, to magnify him. But the part of worshiping God that comes with serving people, that's got to start tomorrow. That's got to start at work, at school, in your families. Maybe you want to be a, an incredible young Christian, and maybe you feel led tonight to go pray for one of your friends. That would be a form of worship to God. And tonight, I'm also going to give every single person in this room an opportunity to practice the discipline of confession. And if any of you are familiar with the Catholic Church, uh, traditionally, I don't know that all of them do this anymore. I've heard they don't, uh, or a lot of them don't. But they used to have a box 
and you would go sit in one side of the box and you'd confess to a, a priest on the other side of the box. That is not uh, a specified practice that we must do. It says confess to a person. And then it says that a prayer of a righteous person is powerful and produces good results. I don't know about you, but I want to have victory over sin. I want to be healed and free of sin. So not only do I want to confess, not only am I going to not care about whatever, whoever thinks of me. Oh, they're confessing. They must be busted up. I don't care. My eternity is too important. My relationship with God is too important to care what random person thinks of me. Who cares? Is God the most important or not? If he is, you'll show it by your actions, not by your words. So here's the deal. I want all the youth leaders to line the front. Now, our youth leaders don't get paid, but we wouldn't have them as a youth leader if we didn't consider them to be generally righteous. So while it's good to have a friend that you can confess to and, and hold accountable, tonight I'm actually going to have every single person here, you're going to think of one thing, one sin that you're struggling with. You might say, Logan, I stole a piece of candy from the grocery store two days ago. You better confess that tonight because they want to pray with you, and we want you to be healed of theft. Some of you, you might be gossiping. Every conversation, you're trying to fill it with gossip, trying to make something interesting because you can't figure out what to say about yourself or what you're thinking or feeling, so you just want to talk about everyone else. Gossip is a sin. You should confess it and let us pray for you so you can get healing. And the elephant in the room, whenever we talk about sin, a lot of people think of lust. Maybe you're struggling with lust in this room. Great, confess it. We want to pray with you so you can find healing. Are you guys ready for that tonight? You guys want to find healing and freedom from sin tonight? Some of you, you're just making me mad. I'm just teasing, but not really. So what am I saying? Let me clarify. Every single person in this room is getting prayed for tonight. I don't care how big or small you think your sin is. God's word already said that we all fell short. So you've got something. So you don't have to feel ashamed about walking up and praying with a leader because every single person here is not perfect. And if someone doesn't walk up and get prayed, they're a liar. They're a liar. Don't be a liar. So I'm going to pray for us tonight. And I'm believing, and I want you to believe with me that God wants to give you healing and freedom, that God wants to prepare your hearts to speak big things to you in 2024 in these moments of worship. Are we ready? Nope. Are we ready? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, that you are love and that you are light, that there's no darkness in you. God, we thank you that despite our imperfections and our mistakes, you love us the same that while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die. And Jesus, you chose to obey and give it all. God, I know that there are people in this room that have been living in bondage, living in sin, even living in darkness for some. Father, would you pour your love out on those people tonight? Would you give them the forgiveness that they need tonight? Holy Spirit, would you move through these youth leaders as they pray for and encourage these students? Would there be fullness of healing? Would every single student leave this place tonight feeling cleansed, clean of the past, clean of the things that have held them in chains for maybe forever? God, I believe that you want to do powerful things tonight, and God, we want to magnify you at all, at all the same. So God, we, we praise you. We ask for you to show up. Give us the boldness to step out and practice these disciplines in your mighty name. Everyone say it. Amen. Amen. Find a leader, pray with them, and then go ahead and practice worship as well.